Dr. Song is a uh, was uh, uh, did her complete her uh, medical education at Yonsei University um, in the graduate nineteen ninety nine, and then I went on to do urology training training um, in, you know, uh, in Korea for women first of all who was troubling in that sense as well as our academic work. Uh, but, uh, so she did that and then I uh, finished her training in 2004 and in 2007 she completed her fellowship. Uh, and then uh, uh, was appointed a faculty member in urology oncology at the prestigious uh, hospital called the Asan Medical Center, uh, which is actually a, a uh, medical school and a center sponsored and supported by the Hyundai uh, Kula Um After that, uh, she also went on to uh, do a PhD work um, on TGS beta and in looking to in renal sarcoma. Uh, and then um, um, after um, completing and starting her faculty appointment, uh, she took a year uh, to come to the States, uh, did a fellowship, did a fellowship at uh, the Morris Home Cataract. And I think during the time, she did a master's of public health MPH at, at downtown. First computer first of her education. Um, so uh, her clinical interest is mainly in kidney cancer uh, you know, from the uh, laparoscopic and robotic renal surgery. She's a renowned and leading surgeon in Korea as well as in East Asia. Um, but um, this topic came up you know, when she uh, first um, you know, talked about one day. She said, Hey, what do you think about radiation in kidney cancer? Just what do you mean? <laughs> that the first thing from my mind. Um, but I think, you know, she's going to pursue this topic while she being a, a terrific and an incredibly talented surgeon. I think the other side should continue to push the envelope in terms of how can I do better? Because just because we're good at what we do doesn't necessarily mean that is the best for the patient. Uh, so I think patients with some who's got a good indication, reasonable indication that she's pursued this topic um, of radiation and kidney cancer. Um, so it's nice to love to hear the, her perspective, her experience on this topic. Stereotactic body radiation therapy for primary renal sarcoma. Oh, thank you for coming back. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That is a very nice introduction that I, I don't know if he does that to anyone else. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. I am very thrilled to be here. And I, I wasn't expecting this beautiful campus here. It's really beautiful here, and I am thrilled. I am very honored to have this opportunity to uh, share my work with you today. My uh, uh, practice primarily mainly involves surgery in the kidney cancer. And my research interest mainly focuses on the kidney cancer related areas, kidney cancer and the renal function in the kidney cancer patients. So I need to uh, apologize in advance that my knowledge in radiation therapy is less than limited. And so this project, as, as Dr. Kim said, was a, a collaboration with my radiation oncologist colleague, uh, although it was initiated at my request. So today I'll be sharing the urologist's points of interest from, from the urologist's point. So uh, as you know, renal carcinoma is not uncommon. The incidence worldwide is about 0.3 million and is steadily increasing. And the burden of kidney cancer uh, varies depending on the countries. And the high income North America and the United States is here where it is the highest. And I come from here where it's the high income Asia Pacific. Oops, excuse me. And the age standardized instance rate per 100,000 men is estimated to be in 2017, 17 in the United States. And it was between seven and nine in Korea. So it's quite different in, in the between these two countries. But more alarming is that we are the top two areas where the burden is increasing the fastest. So in the past 17 years, the incident, number of incident cases more than doubled in these two areas. And from where I came from, the high income Asia Pacific, we had the steepest curve. So this is a huge 
uh, public health problem. And among the top 10 leading causes of death in Korea in 2021, cancer was by far the number one cause in both men and women. And especially in men, cancer was more than three times the number of the, the, the cause of death in men and followed by cardiovascular disease. And when you compare this chart with the same chart for the, the people in the United States, this is for both men and women. And you can see that heart disease is the leading cause followed by cancer. But, and the cancer uh, affects more than 600,000 people in the United States. And without adjusting for accounting for the age differences, age distribution differences in the United States population, if you calculate the crude uh, uh, mortality, you can say that the uh, cancer burden on, on the United States affects about uh, 184 to about 190. So crudely speaking, the burden of cancer in these two societies seem quite similar. So we have that much of cancer burden on our societies. So among the top 10 cancers, in Korea in 2019, kidney cancer was number seven. And the incidence was about 16.2 in men per 100,000 men. So remember how it was between seven and nine several years back, so it has more than doubled and it's gradually rising. In the United States it was number six. So the order is slightly different, but you can see that Top three GU cancers is among the top 10 cancers in happening in the men. And you can see that it is a, and they are on steadily on the rise. And it's a big problem for the men in both countries. And the median age of diagnosis is 65 years and it varies depending on how much the, the abdominal imaging is used in each country. And, and because of that, the greatest increase is observed to be in patients older than 70 years, the elderly population. And this is important because many of these patients have other comorbidities. And the, the, the kidney cancer increase, the absolute increase as well as the increased detection uh, can be, attribu uh, can be uh, attributed to a, a lot of things, but increased life expectancy is for one. The average life expectancy in 2021 in the United States for men was 75, and in Korea it was 80. And aging society is a huge problem for us now, but they are living longer. And the absolute cancer incidence increase is itself is also another problem. And we also see that we see more and more people uh, with a long-term, we see more and more people surviving one type of cancer we need to get second and third cancers. So we see these long-term cancer survivors. And of course they were, they had higher chances of receiving repeated scans of their abdomen and they had higher chances of being detected with other types of benign as well as malignant diseases. But still we, we find more things in these patients. And particularly in Korea, they, people are really interested in uh, health screening and promoting programs. And we have a public health insurance system, which has a public health screening program as well. And added to these people do uh, private insurance screening programs and also radiographic examinations in private clinics. Primary clinics are highly affordable and they are readily done. So all these things contributed to explosive increase in incidentally detected renal masses. I have shown you this slide before, and I haven't pointed out that uh, cancers of stomach and liver are numbers two and five in Korea, and we're also uh, hepatitis B endemic. So these diseases involve regular upper abdominal imaging, which includes kidneys in their scanning areas. So these have also contributed to uh, increased detection of small renal masses in patients with age and also significant uh, medical comorbidities like advanced liver cirrhosis. 
So this is the number of RCC surgical cases at my hospital. And in the past two decades, just number of surgical cases have just dramatically increased. We're now doing up to about thousand cases every year. And uh, blue is T1A, so up to 40% are T1A. And T1A and B together, they are more than 70% now. And this is just surgical cases. So also increased are uh, these small renal masses and more frail and surgically unfit patients. And these patients, you don't want to recommend any partial nephrectomies, no, no nephrectomies, no surgeries at all. So, and, and they are increasing. And of course, we have uh, less invasive alternatives for these poor surgical candidates. Uh, radiofrequency ablation and cryoablation are the two most popular and two most studied. And for tumor sizes between two and three centimeters, local control, uh, disease-free, uh, progression-free survival have been reported to be between 90 and 95% at five years, which is not bad for considering the characteristics of our candidate population. 90 and 95%. And cryoablation is generally done under anesthesia, so it wouldn't be an option for our patient. But uh, for radiofrequency ablation too, it does have clear limitations that cannot be overcome. For instance, treatment efficacy is reduced if the tumor is too central near sizable vessels or collecting system near water because of the heat sink effect. And if it is too anterior near the bowels, the operator tends to retract the, the, the blazing areas because you don't want to grill the bowel. And if it is cystic, it just doesn't work. And, and, it, and radiofrequency ablation is, is very operator dependent. And it also matters if you're, whether you're using CT scans or the ultrasound for your guidance. So it's, it's the, the uh, efficacy is quite variable depending on who's doing it for you. And more importantly, you just cannot do it for patients with uncorrected coagulopathies, uh, patients with advanced liver cirrhosis, or those patients with severe uh, cardiovascular or cerebrovascular diseases who just cannot be taken off their meds. And, and, and increase in this group of patients was how we began discussing this project. And because uh, people had already been doing uh, ablative radiation therapy uh, for uh, uh, metastatic renal carcinoma in the brain. Uh, so renal carcinoma had been considered radio resistant and, and no one was thinking about radiation, but for uh, uh, renal carcinoma to the brain, people had been treating uh, gamma knife and, and, it, it, and people were thinking it was radio resistant until gamma knife started showing local control rates beyond a 90% at one year. And these are all uh, retrospective series. And, and we all know that uh, renal carcinoma metastasis to brain, it's, it's bad. People die within the year of diagnosis and, and it's not good, but, we, but, uh, but surprisingly, local control rate was uniformly beyond 90% at one year when the radiation was given about 20 grays in a single dose. So with these results, people began doing it for extracranial disease. For some oligometastatic brown cell carcinoma, uh, people started giving it in less than five fractions. So hypofractionated, uh, uh, hypofractionated uh, radiation for oligometastatic brown cell carcinoma. People began seeing some good control rates up to 90% at one year. So that was similar to what they saw in the brain. So people started thinking that if we can give uh, somewhere on average 10 grays per session, maybe the, the renal cell carcinoma, <coughs> excuse me, is not that radio resistant after all. So uh, such ablative high dose perfection radiation therapy became possible uh, through advancement in radiation technology as well as radiation technique uh, through improved image guidance like advanced radiation planning and using higher number of beams. So we, we came to think that maybe if we can give a sufficiently high dose, uh, you know, if you give a high enough radiation, it can kill a person. So if you give the uh, renal cell carcinoma a highly sufficient dose without uh, harming the adjacent organs, maybe a primary renal cell carcinoma uh, that needs definitive treatment 
can also be managed with ablative radiation therapy. And then came the CyberKnife system. This is a respiration synchronized therapy as opposed to respiration gated therapy. Uh, when you do uh, retroperitoneal robot partial nephrectomy, you notice how the kidney really moves up and down with the respiration movement. Uh, with each uh, diaphragmatic movement, you see how it moves like you're in a rocking ship. Uh, so, so because of that movement, when you just use a respiration gated therapy, you, you, you are essentially giving half the, half the intended dose because the kidney moves too much. But with this system, the machine recognizes a, 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 a sensor. In, in our cases, we used a gold markers that we inserted around the tumor in the kidneys. And so the, the machine recognizes that sensor in the marker and every 30 seconds during treatment, it will identify the sensors and then sync with it and then adjust its beam before it shoots it. So it, it adjusts its movement and, and, and syncs with the therapy and syncs with the, the, the location of the, of the sensors. So through that movement, uh, it monitors its rays. And when we monitored its tracking, we found that 99% of the tracking error was within six millimeters craniocaudally, which was the largest, and laterally and anterior posteriorly it was less than three millimeters. The, the margin of error is very, very slim. And the, the, the radiation affects the surrounding tissue. The radiation effect on the surrounding tissue could be very minimal with this tracking system. So we plan for, and this is how it looks. So for the treatment in this neon blue area in, in the center of the tumor, we would plan for this area. And this is where the radiation is going in from all these directions. 194 beams would enter from all these directions, accounting for all these surrounding organs. And with this, with that narrow margin and sharp exit dose gradient, you would uh, uh, theoretically it will it will leave the uh, immediately adjacent organs untouched, and 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 maximize its treatment effect. And theoretically, it will have no uh, or no to minimal adverse effects from from the radiation. And 42 grays given in three fractions with this system will be equivalent to biologically effective dose of 142 grays, and we thought that it would be uh, sufficient for even for venous carcinoma. So we plan for a phase two study. It will be uh, like uh, compared to conventional radiation, it will be like giving the same uh, same blow, but at a, a, a much bigger bigger bulk or floods. So we plan for a phase two study, and we we plan for 40 patients with renal cell carcinoma, but for surgically high risk patients. So for chronological age, they would be uh, 75 or higher, which means uh, life expectancy uh, less than five years, or ECOP performance status two or higher, or Charleston index three or higher, or those patients refusing surgery but wanting active treatment. And with a successful treatment, we were hoping to obtain a local control at two years to be somewhere between partial nephrectomy and a radiofrequency ablation. And that was because that's how it was in other uh, general non-radio resistant cancers. So we were hoping it will be somewhere between that. And personally, I was hoping that it will be somewhere closer to partial nephrectomy, but we wanted to stay conservative. On top of all other uh, advantages coming from the outpatient-based and short treatment course and non-invasiveness and, and doable in, in patients with uncorrected coagulopathies. And the study went like this. When the patients were enrolled, we would screen them for uh, distant metastases, and then we would treat, for, treat them for 42, treat them for uh, 42 grays in three sessions, which will be every other day. So it will take them one week. And after that treatment, we will follow them for two years. And during those times, we'll monitor the renal function of each kidney with the DTPA renal scans. So we enrolled 40 patients, but two patients didn't come back after three months. So we had 38 patients for analysis in our initial study. 
So 38 patients, 35% uh, had ECOG status two, and median Charleston index was six. Median tumor size was 2.1 centimeters. Nephrometry score was nine and 10 in 28%. So it's quite complex tumors in a lot of patients. 63% had clear cell tumors, and we had three patients with polysemia, four complex cysts, which we did not do biopsy. So this is the waterfall plot for tumor response at 29 months. Median tumor size decreased from 2.1 centimeter to 1.7 centimeter. Average size reduction was 14.6%, which was achieved at three months. And uh, we found out that the contrast enhancement pattern did not change. There was no necrosis, no nothing. It did not change. And the you know, perfusion did not change within the tumor, around the tumor, nothing changed. And we, the best objective response we observed was complete response in six patients, 15.8%, partial remission in 31%, stable disease in 47%. And we did see progressive disease in two patients, 5.2%. This is the case with partial remission. He came with a 2.3 centimeter in the center of the kidney. And at three months, it was 1.8 centimeters, 20% reduction. At 12 months, it was 12.2 12 12, uh, uh, centimeters. That's the gold marker we inserted. So the enhancement pattern did not change. And the renal perfusion did not change before and after the treatment. If we had done, uh, radiofrequency ablation for that tumor, we would have ended up with a large wedge-shaped implant around the tumor and in, in the kidneys. So that's the partial remission. This is the case with complete remission. He came with a two centimeter tumor. At three months, it was 1.7 centimeter, 14% reduction. At 12 months, it was nine millimeters. And then in 30 months, it was gone. So it was, there was a scar remaining and, and there was no evidence of descent metastases at 30 months. This is the case with progressive disease. He was, he was a 2.8 centimeter tumor initially and at three months it was 1.5 centimeters. So there was a 45% reduction initially. But then at 12 months, it, it slightly grew back 1.8 centimeters, but we thought maybe we will see. And then at 18 months, it was larger, 2.2 centimeters. It was still smaller than his initial tumor, but it, it started growing back. And then at 30 months, it was 4.7 centimeters. So, <coughs> but even at 2.2 centimeters, we just couldn't do anything and we just had to watch because he was just too sick to do anything. So we had to watch. And at 4.7 centimeters, we are suspecting two long nodules in both in both upper lungs, tiny lung nodules. So actuarial three-year progression through survival is estimated to be 94.7% at 29 months. And renal function monitored on DTPA renal scans. The blue is the treated kidney. So it seemed that GFR of the irradiated kidney uh, slowly went down until one year. So, it, so the lowest point, it was by 23%. But then at, after one year, it started coming back up. So by two years, it was by 15%. But absolute GFR itself is from 37 to 30 to 32. So it's really not that much change. On the other, the contralateral contra kidney, it just remained unchanged throughout the, the observation period. And the total GFR remained unchanged. So it's really not much change. Toxicity, this is toxicity profile at one month. We did find uh, grade one and two nausea in a couple of patients. All were self-remitting and they all resolved within one month. These were toxicities because we asked them, but most patients didn't say much, not much, not much anything. We did have one paranephric hematoma after gold marker insertion, which also resolved spontaneously. So there really was no toxicity, no adverse effects from the radiation, especially for tumors on the lateral or the posterior side. And remember how old and how frail these patients were, people were just happy with their treatments. When we analyzed for factors, potential factors that could predict uh, complete response after the treatment, we found 
papillary subtype and the percent tumor size reduction at three months to be significant. But when you look at the uh, confidence interval for the papillary subtype, it is just too wide, 1.12 to 3,000. So it, we're, we're not confident with that. And you know, uh, the papillary renal cell carcinoma is related to a MET mutation. And we also know that MET gene is related to uh, radiation resistance. So for those two reasons, we're not confident with that result. But as for the percent tumor size reduction at three months, uh, we thought that could be uh, meaningful. So we drew the curve. And we found that the area under the curve was 0.849. And for the best threshold of 20%, we had the highest sensitivity and specificity. So for uh, tumor sizes that reduce beyond 20% at three months, it could be a predictor for complete remission after the radiation therapy. So encouraged by these results, we, I started recommending this treatment for more patients. So, so by now we have about 83 patients who were treated with this. And, they, and I still stay on uh, surgically unfit patients. And, and so they are all ECOG performance one or higher. And Charleston index is still uh, median six. We're, we have slightly larger tumors, 2.3 centimeters, and slightly more complex tumors, 33% nephrometry score nine and 10. And uh, we have more clear cell and less popularity. And I'll show you why this is meaningful. We have more clear cell. And pathologically unproven are all cystic tumors. I thought cystic tumors, I had the impression that cystic tumors uh, did better. I, I mean, they, they involute and they, they become their remission more than the solid tumors, but on the analysis, it did not. So it, it, it's just my personal impression, but, but still it works. It works better than the radio frequency ablation. So this is a uh, waterfall at 29 months. The 2.3 centimeter tumor became 1.8 centimeter on average. Average size reduction was 25%, which was also achieved at three months, which means after three months, there is not much reduction. And best response was complete remission in 10%, partial remission in 22%, stable disease in 63%, 63% and the progressive disease in the two patients I had shown you earlier. And these, uh, these, these people here who say uh, no change, these people and, and these small people here, we have been following these people, people and they have been watched for average of 46 months now and they show no change. So, so far they are doing okay. So we're watching them. So the case with the CR I've shown you that he had been doing good until 30 months. So at 60 months, he's still doing okay. So, uh, and, and no signs of distant metastases. <clears throat> so survival is now 97.6% at three years. And the renal function change seems similar. So it, it goes down until one year, but then it starts to come back after that and, and, and comes back to what it was before treatment at two years. So it seems that the radiation does not affect uh, the surrounding renal parenchyma and the contralateral kidney remains the same. And the total GFR remains unchanged. And about the potential factors that uh, may predict a complete response after radiation treatment, only the percent tumor size reduction at three months after treatment remained significant and the papillary subtype completely lost its significance even in the univariate analysis. This may be because it is the truth or it may be because it's the, the number of patients just was just too small in our analysis. We need to follow up on that. So we learned from this trial that uh, T1 for, for renal cell carcinoma, for a small renal cell carcinoma, uh, stereotoxic body radiation therapy did work. It provided excellent local control at three years with minimal toxicity. And people, patients' general condition, as well as other medical conditions, remained unchanged, which was very important for our patients because we had done this in, in quite frail patients. 
and, and, and their general qualities of life remained unchanged and patients were quite happy. An impact on the function of the irradiated renal unit was not significant and GFR recovered by 24 months. And the total GFR remained largely unchanged throughout the monitoring period. And we think that tumor size reduction beyond 20% at three months after treatment may be a predictor of complete response. And one question that remains in, at the back of our mind is that why don't we just uh, let them be? I mean, they are just very old and, and just too sick anyways. And, and, and besides the cultural sentiment in, in, that we have in Koreans, that when, when we find something, even, in, even for very old, very sick people, when they find something new in, in them, they just want to get it out, out of their system anyways. They, they, especially when they hear that, they, that there is a possibility that it could be cancer, they just want to have something definitive done to it. They don't want to observe it. They don't want to see what happens to it. Even when we tell them that it will not affect you, Beside that cultural sentiment, in the, in the DISARM study, up to 42% required delayed intervention during active surveillance triggered by tumor growth. And yes, up to 40%, the tumors did not show any growth, but in, in more than half, it did grow. And when it does grow, when, when it does grow, the, the patients, your patients will have become older, and they will have been, become sicker, the tumor will have become larger. So it will become a larger predicament for you. And the other thing is that the renal cell carcinoma is a very hypervascular tumor. And of course, when it is small, spontaneous rupture is a very rare thing. It really doesn't happen often. But these patients, especially with those uh, uncorrected coagulopathies or anticoagulant users, even these small tumors, they could become a source of significant morbidity or mortality. I did have a patient, <clears throat> excuse me, I did have a patient with advanced liver cirrhosis uh, who came to me with a small renal mass and I had recommended him as was recommended by the textbook that it was not to be of any problem for him and it was not gonna cause him any problem because it was just too small, just, just deal with his liver problem and all that, but then it did rupture. And when it did, there was just nothing no one could do. And, it, and he kept on bleeding and bleeding and, 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 he, and unfortunately he had to die from it. So, so it, it could become a source of a significant problem. So we thought if there is something that can be done for these patients uh, without adding any morbidity to it. And, 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 and that will be a, a very big and powerful tool for, our, for us urologists to have. And of course, it will not replace partial nephrectomy or anything, but if we keep developing these, and it will be a big tool in our pocket. So that's how we began this project. And, and, and fortunately, it, with the advancement in the radiation of uh, people, it, so far, I think we, are, we haven't successfully so far. So. so thank you. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes. Thank you so much for a great talk. Very innovative, thought provoking. Um, I, thought, um, I really appreciated your slide at the end talking about the alternative of active surveillance. And um, you know, I take care of uh, patients primarily with renal cell, and I, I spend a lot of time talking to people about active surveillance. And and I, um, I know you mentioned there's cultural differences here. The vast majority of my patients who have a small renal mass choose surveillance, especially those with masses less than three centimeters. And I think in particular, if you look at the patients with masses less than three centimeters and the surveillance literature around them, they really do quite well. And the ten-year disarm um, outcomes. Uh, the 10 year cancer specific survival, whether they have people chose upfront intervention or did an uh, active surveillance, whether an initial period or never required intervention, the cancer specific survival is like 99%. And so it's really hard sometimes, I think, especially for comorbid patients who have a short life expectancy, that the CUDA cough nomogram would predict are really 
at very little risk of dying of renal cell. It's hard to argue in favor of an intervention sometimes. And, um, you know, it seems that rather than the most, rather than surgery being the competing option for them, the real competing option really is just leaving them the way they are, as you mentioned. Um, how, how many patients do you uh, put on surveillance? So, so I, I was amazed by the number of, of surgeries that you do for T1A lesion. Um, it's up to nearly a thousand you said per year, uh, or seventy percent of them are T1A or T1B. Um, what is there a correspondingly high number of people going on surveillance, or, or, no, or no? No. Uh, so I actually counted the number of patients that I put surveillance. There, there is about twenty in total. So that would be like less than 10% of my patients. People don't like surveillance. And my, I guess, I guess it, it depends on how you speak to them, right? But, and, and, I, and I am not a proponent of surveillance because if you're not going to do anything about them, why do you survey at all? If, you, if you're going to, if you're going to do something, then why don't you just do it now? That's my idea. Are you asking um, me why? No, no, that's well, fine. Like, I'd be very happy to give you an answer. Um, so why is because um, when I can't point to any data that an intervention actually improves someone's quality of life or lengthens their life, it's very hard for me to offer an intervention that has risk. A 20% fine in GFR at first year, um, uh, uh, cortical atrophy that you showed in the patient with complete response, whether or not it's reflected in your GFR. There's cortical atrophy there. It's unmistakable that, that that's been impacted. It's really hard to say that, that that's a good idea when we know that there has not, and I'm not aware of any, unless it's been published recently, of a single patient with a mass less than three centimeters on surveillance that stayed less than three centimeters. I'm not aware of a single patient developing metastatic disease on surveillance. Masses that started greater than three centimeters or grown greater than three, yes. But less than three centimeters, I'm not aware of a single active surveillance failure from metastasis. The patients who present with small renal masses and metastatic disease are probably different animals. And so, um, I don't know, I, my, the majority of my patients choose surveillance. I put probably four or five people on surveillance this week. Um, for small renal masses. Most of them never require an intervention. In the disarm registry, half the people who have had intervention had intervention because of choice, not for cost, not because of growth, it was choice. And so my patients, the majority of them don't end up getting treated. Uh, so this is, now that I've been here a decade, now I'm trying to figure out when I get to stop following them because so many of them don't ever need treatment. And now it's been 10 years. I'm trying to decide whether or not do I keep following them, do I reduce the frequency? We just do an ultrasound, we do an ultrasound every year, every two years. If they get their life expectancy is very low, then I just stop. Um, tell, them, tell them to come back. Yes. Uh, so, what's the difference between surveillance and intervention? Like, what's the for 10 years. I put people in their 40s on surveillance. Healthy people. It's not, from my patient population, it's not dependent on their overall health, right? Because just because, you know, if, if, it, if it doesn't grow, it's two centimeters wide tree. And so if we think that growth on imaging is, um, you know, a, a, a good predictor of biologic potential, um, and I, I generally. And we know it is kind of do biopsy them all the time. If they're over, if if uh, if it's someone who's kind of inappropriately wanting surveillance, larger than three centimeters, growing lesion, they still want to watch it, then I strongly encourage biopsy. But it don't require a biopsy to get on surveillance. Mm -hmm. But that's not You're comparing your steering for 10 years. Surveillance versus radio frequency to require an intervention with slightly higher risks than what's presented here. So, would the story change at all if, um, I mean, I think it was pretty low morbidity in the data, just for purposes well, yeah, no, of discussion? 
I was just referring now, to that. Now, if we could offer that, would there be different patients that you might sway towards? Yeah, no, but I mean, we have, I, I generally don't, we haven't been doing a lot of RFA here, mostly cried, as you mentioned, um, for, for uh, the small renal masses or partial rare patients, radical or surveillance, but kind of the primary modality. But yeah, I mean, I think there's probably some patients that might might choose to have this done. More than Any other questions? No. Um, how often do you guys utilize renal mass biopsy? Are you, you know, maybe a urologist do it, or do you guys have radiologists do it? Is that a question? Uh, in Korea, we just did a survey, practice pattern survey among the Korean urologists. We found that uh, less than about 20% of the practicing urologists were actually doing renal mass biopsy, but they would do it in less than 10% of their patients. So it's not very often, but I do a lot of biopsies. I do a lot of biopsies. I do it uh, uh, for, so when I, have to uh, refer patients for radiation therapy, I will always have to do it. When I do uh, uh, radical, when I need to do radical nephrectomy for a small renal tumor that is just in the center of the kidney, I will uh, request for a biopsy. And when I need biopsy, I, I always ask for this. I always send them to the radiation, uh, the radiologist. They would do a CT guided radio, uh, biopsy. biopsy. Any other questions? Why, why were you asking? I'm just curious. We had Dr. Clayman come as a visiting professor. He was you know, really proponent of renal mass biopsy and urologists doing that. But it seems it's very variable around the world, you know, whether urologists do it in the office or we send them to radiologists. So I'm just curious. So all our publications they say <laughs> it's completely safe and it's there is just uh, 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 non-diagnostic rates are very low and it's, it's completely okay to do. But when you ask around, nobody's doing it. So it's it's funny. So it must be a publication bias, but I do it all the time. And it's really okay. Yeah, I, I do them all. So <coughs> I do a lot. Um, it depends on if it's going to help the team manage them. Mm. Uh, you know, some yes. patients who like, no matter what the biopsy result is, it's not going to yeah. change your management. They don't do it. One of the issues here, interestingly, there is a, actually a radiation oncologist at our, or sorry, a radiation, an interventional radiologist at our institution who um, cites uh, some anecdotal evidence to patients saying that he doesn't think they should have a renal mass biopsy because of needle tract seeding. And I will, and so it's luck of the draw that if he sees your patient, he may actually try to convince them to not get a biopsy, which is bananas. But um, no, but we do we do a lot of. Them. We do a lot. I think Dr. Renzoli had a question. Okay. Dr. Renzoli? So, oh, hi. I was just wondering if um, you're, I know you said you're focused on renal cell, but does the same approach to a more proactive uh, treatment regimen for low risk prostate cancer in your country, is it similar? Like there's much more treatment than active surveillance or is prostate cancer treated somewhat differently with respect to active surveillance? I may not be accurate, but I think it is probably uh, more treatment oriented. Yeah, probably. so that's more of the approach in Korea is to be more proactive with all malignancies regardless. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Joe, I, I've visited Korea multiple times and I think that's general consensus that patients in general do not like sitting on cancer diagnosis. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So I have a question about your um the, the responses. Do you um plan on doing any sort of correlative studies, um, sequencing, I mean, if they have the disparate responses, even with the same histologic types, and if some are growing, I was actually fascinated by how fast the one of the tumors grew. So I think there's a lot to learn, I think, biologically about these um, different behaviors. Um, any plan on sequencing them? The biopsy tissues? Or just him? 
This is one patient. Right. Well, yeah, I'm just wondering. So, if I will have to know see. what to expect before no, I. No, what I'm saying, the, the, the patients, you have the 40 patients or 80 patients, how they did. Right. So, yeah, if, if you have. I actually have a plan tissues, to, yeah. to do something about these biopsy specimens because we all we know from the biopsy yeah. specimens right now is whether it is cancer or not. And we don't trust their grades. But we should know. We should know better so that we can we can see if they will grow, if they yeah. will grow fast, if they will not grow. You no, know, right. so we should. So we have plans to do some more molecular work with those. But yeah. but I didn't have any plans on this. But maybe yes, I will. I'll be fascinated to find out because I think that may give you more of an idea because if you're seeing you know the two and a half, you know, twenty centimeter mass grow that fast, you know, is it radiation induced or is it just what was supposed to or not? Anyways, there's a lot of questions that are raised here, uh, but maybe some sort of a sequencing uh, would be able to predict how they're going to do it. And maybe those patients select that for treatments, uh, but not enough work is being done. I think of the trial, I think of the, uh, the, the correlative values of the correlative studies, I think would be tremendous here, because I just don't think there's enough data or anything. And, I'm not aware of anybody uh, to be looking at the genetics level, genomics level of previous responses in the real cell. Yes. Could you, do you think there's is there a um, do you think there's a spectrum of radiation dose received based on how well the uh, depending on like breathing motion or how well the the, the beam is registered to that location? Because I think one of the things in the complete response you showed is that there's like some radiation, some obvious signs that the radiation impact on the kidney. And you wonder whether like differences in response might not just be, you know, um, okay. genetic or molecular, but maybe having to do with actual radiation dose received. Yeah, within the tumor. Yeah. Hmm. I think one of them showed that the rest was more central and maybe had a watershed effect also in the collecting system. I can't recall exactly, but I think that's a good point. Is that there are technique details that like this? How much radiation is received, minimum and maximum, in in the areas that we we we, we draw? And that's a, that's a great. So maybe like this much. There there may be a, a a gradient like what you meant within the tumor, but that's that's really. I don't know if this much can make that much of a difference within the tumor. Really, it's it's ninety. It's uh, it's really not much difference within the tumor. It shouldn't be, but if that could be the source for the radio resistance in the tumor, and and of course and 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 of course, if the tumor size becomes larger than four centimeters, the 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 efficacy is. Uh, significantly reduces. That's because you know that 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 area becomes larger. So that may be true, but for uh, for this size tumors, I was told that it shouldn't. But maybe I'm not sure. That's like the plan, though. That's right? the plan. I'm talking about like actual dose delivered, depending on how much the kidney is moving. Oh, well, the moving shouldn't be a problem because it is it is supposed to follow the movement with the system. But but when you are not when when the machine is not moving with the kidney, then that should be a problem. So I guess that's that it, that explains why the SBRT results are so diverse across the institutions because not not everybody has the same same uh, mechanism. That's the uh, respiration gated therapy when you are just just radiating at, at one point and, and the kidney is just going up and down. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.